I'm excited to introduce David um, David Kaplan, who is a co-author for um, this book that Joel Peterson wrote in conjunction with David, which is The Ten Laws of Trust. We're going to be talking more about it. Um, so David, um, please introduce Joel. Uh, thank you. Uh, showing how old I am, uh, I remember when I showed up a little while ago, that I had my first full-time journalism job in this building back in the age of dinosaurs. Uh, it was a print newspaper. Uh, a lot has changed since then, including uh, you guys now being in the building and that newspaper not being in the building anymore. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I met Joel a few years ago and have come to learn in working with him why he's considered such a treasure among CEOs, boards, he's chairman of the board of JetBlue, and as a beloved professor at Stanford where he's mentored many entrepreneurs and uh, students who've gone on to work at Google or who had worked at Google previously. For purposes of this book, I may be his number one student when he told me about the topic and showed me some posts he had written and speeches he had given, I was skeptical. Was this stuff about trust pap? Was he a Pollyanna? And as I came to learn from him over many classes and sessions we would have in person and on the phone electronically, um, and as I helped him form his thoughts on paper, which became this book, I learned that it isn't and he's not, and that's what he's here to talk about. Joel? So I think you're going to interview me, but before you do, uh, I just have to tell a Google story. So I teach at uh, Stanford Business School, and the dean there had Eric Schmidt, told Eric Schmidt that he should sit in on my class, because as he said, at the room temperature, is really good in this class. And I, whenever I teach, I spot people who are not part of the normal classroom, and I have them introduce themselves. And this was maybe 10 years ago or whatever. So I called on uh, this older gentleman that was sitting in the class. I said, would you please introduce yourself? And he said, hi, I'm Eric Schmidt. Really glad to be here. And I said, well, Eric, you need to tell the class who you work for. And the class just broke out into laughter, thinking, what a, who is this professor who has no idea who Eric Schmidt is? Now, that was before Eric Schmidt was Eric Schmidt. But still, he was a pretty important guy. So in any event, I, I do teach, as David said, a lot of uh, people who've worked at Google and then a lot who come out of the GSB and come to Google. So I'm really delighted to be here. And I think you're doing it as a kind of a QA. and a So let's, yeah. and I don't know where she's headed. Yeah. Either. You know, when I'm given a mic and, and a free free forum to ask any questions, I'm excited. To be here. Yeah, okay, we'll switch over. Gotta, Already yeah. playing musical chairs. But um, welcome officially, Joel, to um, Talks at Google and, and to have you here in New York City. Um, so before we um, get right into the book about, about trust, I'm sure you're all interested in hearing more about your professional development and all the successes you've had in your career. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about your background and, and how you got into into the hot seat? So uh, I went to Harvard Business School, and uh, there was a guy who put a 3 by 5 card on the bulletin board that said, looking for a French speaker to go to the French Riviera and work. And I just thought, my high school buddies are never going to believe this. And so I got uh, interested, ended up taking the job. I went not to the French Riviera, but to Paris and then to Lyon. Ended up in the real estate business. Long story short, there was a lot of workouts, a lot of issues at that time. I became the treasurer of the company uh, at, I think, about age 29 or something like that. And we didn't have any cash. If you know what the treasurer does, they manage cash. We didn't have any. <laughs> so, uh, and that caused the chief financial officer to leave. And I became the chief financial officer. So at age 29, I was the chief financial officer of the largest private real estate development company in the world. And I didn't have any idea what I was doing. And uh, one thing led to another. And I ultimately ended up as the CEO of uh, Trammell Crow Company. Uh, and then I ended up teaching, starting to teach at Stanford. And then um, I started my own investment firm, private equity growth capital firm. And then I started a ventures firm. And then a couple of real estate funds and uh, other things. So we've backed maybe now 200 entrepreneurs so I've started a number of companies and backed a lot of entrepreneurs. And it's really from that that this 
these observations about trust come, as I've seen companies that have failed or not based on whether or not they build a high trust culture. Um, and so I guess that's a great segue into the next question. So in the book, in a lot of your writing, you talk about how um, your life is a testament to the power of trust. And so in your professional, um, in your career, in your personal life, how have you instilled trust in your relationships? So uh, I started out uh, with parents who really were trusting. I, it was a gift. I didn't really, really realize. But if I would make a mistake, they would see that as a preamble to success the next time. Have any of you read Carol Dweck's book? It's phenomenal, I think. It's really changed. So I only see a few people nodding their heads, but you really ought to read this book called Mindset. And it's fundamentally about uh, you know accepting failure, seeing failure as a preamble to success. Well, I started out with parents that saw that uh, in me, and it really just... And then uh, what I've tried to do is mimic that in relationships, mm -hmm. and most of the time it works. So most of the time trust works. If you extend trust to people, they don't like to disappoint you. Uh, they fulfill what it was they promised. You have more trust in them. You trust them with something greater, and it becomes this virtuous cycle. Mm -hmm. And so it's really been repeated. So I have seven children. And um, I, I always say to people, I like most of my kids most of the time. <laughs> and so most of them don't disappoint me. Most of them really live up to, and if I trust them, they will actually try to live up to it. And so I think that's actually, there's a principle in there for people who are building businesses, who are growing businesses, it's pushing the power uh, to people. And so when you talk about trust and personal, and you're in your own house with your family and then professionally, how do you define trust? What does that mean to you? So trust is ceding uh, authority, the ability to act to another party. So when you give up control, you have to trust. And you're trusting somebody to look out for you, to do what's in your interest. We do it all the time. You do it with doctors, dentists, lawyers, accountants. We, we do it professionally all the time. Sometimes in, our pers in interpersonal relationships, we're a little wary. We're a little bit cautious. Mm -hmm. and, and rightfully so. We should be careful. We should be smart about how we use this very powerful tool. I think trust. The contract that you and I have, if we trust each other, it's kind of a thermonuclear contract. If done well, it's really powerful. It'll take us both to places we'd not otherwise go. If poorly done, it ends in betrayal. And so that was going to be my follow-up question. It's like we rehearsed this already. Um, so when you trust somebody and then they betray you, how do you overcome that? And how do you re-empower yourself to trust them again? Or how do you kind of cope with that type of situation? So it depends on the level of betrayal. You know, if somebody says they're going to do something and they don't do it, that is, in a sense, a betrayal. But that happens all the time. And sometimes it's for good reasons that they don't uh, do it. And so if it's a minor betrayal, I try to get to the bottom of it mm -hmm. and understand it. Because you want to you wanna stop those sorts of things early on. Otherwise, they metastasize. And you end up not trusting somebody, and it builds. And you start looking for data that prove that you shouldn't mm -hmm. trust them. And then trust ends up you know, going in the wrong direction. So I think, uh, I, I think it's, um, it's important to, to trust in little increments and then measure it, see how it's going, and then give more. Now, when the betrayal is larger, when it's really a betrayal of sort of um, a character, where people have really violated something deep and profound, my guess is every one of you have trusted something in your life and every one of you has felt betrayed. You know, and it's a tough thing to overcome. So I would say that if it's one of those betrayals of character, the odds are you're going to wake up in the middle of the night thinking about it. It's going to be the first thing on your mind when you get mm -hmm. up in the morning, and you're going to feel bitter about it. My advice is get over it as fast as you can. That may be years, really, before you get over it. But the way you'll know that you've gotten over it is you're starting to think about the future. You're not thinking about the past. You're not looking in the rearview mirror and saying, I can't believe this person did that to me. Um, so I think you want to get to the future as fast as you can. Um, and so, you know, it's interesting as we're talking about betrayal and trust and with the elections and all the, the political climate that's currently happening right now, there's a lot of constant, um, you know, there's a lot of disrespect, I think, a, a, a around the political community right now of bashing and talking down upon each other. What are your views on the political climate? Um, and what advice would you have for, for the candidates? It's toxic. And it, what happens is when you, when you get into polemics and people get far out on the edge, 
it's very tough to knit things back together. You know when you have strained trust? Mm -hmm. It's very tough. So if people are thinking about actually leading an enterprise after there's been that kind of a battle, it's really tough. And so uh, I, I was just reading the New York Times that two-thirds of the electorate trust neither of the leading candidates. That's shocking. Yeah. For two-thirds of Americans not to trust either of the leading candidates? I mean, I, I find that just appalling. Well, what that means is you can see that it's going to be very tough mm -hmm. to bring people together after that. So I, I would, uh, I, I don't feel great about it. And is there advice that you have? Can they overcome that reputation that they have, say, if they do win the seat, knowing that two-thirds don't trust them? How do they overcome that? So trust is one of these things that you build up a molecule at a time. You build trust a conversation at a time in your life, and you can destroy it in a single act. So I think, I, I actually think that this process of bashing mm -hmm. uh, is damaging. I also think that the American people are the clientele. And so we're the ones who are selecting the people that we're going to hire. Mm -hmm. and fundamentally, we're hiring people to be the president of the United States. So it says a lot about us. Uh, and I would say that, uh, you know, everybody in here is a millennial, it looks like to me, pretty much. Which is one of the great things about, well, maybe not. <laughs> not David, for sure. Not me, for sure. But this is a company of millennials. And, you know, if you look at the millennials, they really, uh, so I get asked this all the time. They're hardworking, they're smart, they want to do the right thing, they care about meaning, they care about balance in their life. But fundamentally, I think they've become a bit of a mistrustful generation. And if you look at the reasons, uh, I mean, they were told, buy a house. That's, that's the right thing to do. And then they've seen their neighbors be foreclosed on. They said, get married. And they see their families divorced in their own families or in neighbors. They were told, go to college. You know, get a college degree, and they find that people get college degrees and they end up with a mountain of debt they can't repay. Um, and so on and on. A lot of these things they've been told to mm -hmm. trust, trust this stuff, um, you know, go to work for a company, and then they find that people get laid off. So they've learned to be a bit mistrustful, a bit wary, and there are good reasons for that. So in some ways, we have an electorate mm -hmm. that's mistrustful, that's a bit angry, and so that the candidates speak to that. Candidates really are just reflections of what's going on and so I think when you have that in the candidates so I don't blame the candidates altogether I kind of say this is where we are right now and I think it really takes somebody to put their arms around us and say hey what do we share there's a lot more that we share than, than divides us um, so you know as you're describing millennial and I think I'm probably one of the older millennials but um, that really resonated with me I think a lot of how I think and approach things is very similar to what you said with the weariness and the mistrust of a lot of decisions we need to make in life um, in your book, you talk about different communication styles of how you can um, learn to trust or kind of clearly communicate trust to others. Um, can you talk a little bit about the communication styles and the methods? The most powerful way to develop trust is to act. Whatever you do, if your words and your actions sync up, people tend to trust you. People are super smart. So even I found that even the newest receptionist in the company knew all kinds of stuff and picked up on stuff whether people were trustworthy mm -hmm. or not so the first thing is that you got to sync up words and actions if they're out of sync it's very hard to develop trust the second communication thing that i always tell the people is part of communication is listening in fact it's probably the most important part of communication if you've been around a good listener they tend to capture what it is you're saying and they tend to listen until uh, you've been able to explicate or tell what it is you're talking about, they've captured it in a way that they can reflect it. And if somebody can communicate in that way, way as a good listener, they've done a whole lot. But, and then I think the other thing that I'd say in a, in a corporation, in a family, in any kind of an organization is communicate lavishly. Mm -hmm. What that means is you don't withhold the bad news. You know, I see a lot of people who try to manage, which in fact in the news business, you guys know that uh, people hold the bad news till Friday afternoon and then dump it, you know, all those kind of manipulations people think but, work. But we in the news business try to publish it Friday morning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> even if it's true, not true. Not Friday. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you know, but, but I think this idea of, of uh, disclosure, of telling people bad news as well as good news, because people are smart. People know. If you learn all of the important news at the water cooler, you know, or in the newspaper, 
you've actually damaged the trust within the organization. Mm -hmm. So I think you have to communicate bad news. You have to uh, communicate before, during, <laughs> and after events. And a lot of times people think that if they just do one or you know that they can have a news flash and that's it. My experience is most events have a long lead up. They have kind of a crescendo that something happens and then there's a period of time when there's kind of a denouement. And I think really effective communicators realize that people need to know information all along the way. So I think those are three ways to think about communication. Um, oh, thanks for sharing that. Um, and so given that the, you need to be more transparent in your communication and kind of message at all points of the process, um, how have you incorporated that in, in the business environment as a leader yourself? Um, and then I guess, what advice do you have for for us as Googlers to instill that type of leadership quality in our, in our future as we continue to grow? So I've tried to think about it two ways. One is sort of broadly leading a team or whatever, where you have to communicate objectives. And uh, when I was uh, managing a partner at Trammell Crow Company, for example, I used to write a partner's letter every two weeks. And I would make sure that everybody yeah. heard from me and it sort of summer. And JetBlue, every Monday we send out a, a, a letter, and it's from a member of the management team, to all 19,000 employees. So there's that kind of communication that keeps everybody on top of mm -hmm. whatever's going on. The other kind, though, is I think a much more personal kind, which I think you can do even if your enterprise doesn't do it. And uh, to me, it's this notion of a standing meeting. So I tend to, when I'm, uh, wherever I am, I tend to go around and stop in people's offices and just say, how are things going? What are you working on now? What obstacles are you having? Is there anything I can do to help? And then typically it's nice to ask them about their lives, mm -hmm. about their family, you know, and to remember something about what was going on in their lives. I mean, caring about people is actually a really powerful thing and not a lot of people don't do it or they, they think it's a technique. No, you actually have to care. It really has to matter to you. If you do that, that communicates all kinds of things. If you don't, then people see through it again. And um, is that the tool or the secret tool that you use to empower your employees um, within the companies that you lead? I don't think there's anything secret about it. I think, uh, I mean, it is out of these conversations that you end up figuring out who to empower and how much. My view of empowering people is, Ultimately, what you want to do is empower people who are closest to the customer. So it's wherever the action is, you want people to feel empowered to make decisions, mm -hmm. that you get better decisions if you can do that. But you can't do it all of a sudden. You can't just dump all the decisions of the organization on your youngest, most remote people. So you have to do it incrementally, and then you measure. So one of the, one of the chapters in the book is about the power of accountability, why, why there has to be accountability. If you're going to trust people, they have to be accountable. And, uh, and so they need to know what you're measuring. Um, otherwise, it's not real trust. You can surprise them by saying, oh, that's not what we were measuring. So I think you kind of move to, to something like that. Um, so I was just referencing my notes really quickly, because one of the things that when, when trust comes up and when you talk about the 10 laws of trust, you immediately think of some of the synonyms or close words, which is trust, respect, honesty. How would you? How would you kind of combine them together, or how do you see them all in relation to one another, um, and how you can live your life in a powerful way and in, in, in an honest way? Well, so I think you mentioned a bunch of virtues that we all aspire to and we all like in our friends or spouses or, or significant others. Those seem to matter. I would say, though, that I categorize all of those under the rubric of character. But that's only one element of trust. If somebody has high character, that is not enough to trust them. You know, we think mm -hmm. that this, this warm, fuzzy feeling, oh gosh, I really like her, therefore I trust her. But uh, I always ask my executives that come in to take these exec courses at Stanford, well, would you trust your mom, whom you trust, high character, to fly a 747 to London? And they said, well, heck no. Well, why wouldn't you? Well, because she's, she doesn't know what she's doing. She's not competent. She's not competent to do that. So if you want to trust somebody, it doesn't just start with honesty and you know all those kinds of things. That's okay. the feel-good character element. There is, there's an element of competence. In order, if you're going to trust somebody, they have to be competent. And if, you're, if you expect to be trusted, you have to be confident, which, competent, which means you deliver on mm -hmm. what you say you're going to do. And then the final thing I tell people is 
people that you trust have to have the authority to act. There's no point in telling David here, who's a lawyer, that I'd really like not to pay taxes this year. You know, I, and you're a lawyer. David has high character. He's very competent. So I'd just like not to pay taxes. He doesn't have the authority to do that. He can't make that happen. So for me to trust him to keep me from paying taxes is folly. It's not smart trust. So trust is, I think, a really hard-edged principle. And you can get really good at being uh, thoughtful about who you trust by, by being kind of analytical, by factor analyzing. What is it that you're really trusting? And so it is those things that you mentioned, but it's not enough. It's inadequate. Um, well, th thanks for pointing that out, because I do, um, and, and, and um, in Joel's book, he does define, you do define the character and the competence and the accountability um, pretty well and pretty detailed as great tools for us to leverage, I think, in our day-to-day. -day. Um, and I want to give you guys an opportunity to ask him some questions as well. So we're going to open the floor to, um, to questions. Um, so there's a mic. Um, Adiola, if you don't mind, just um, Adiola right here is going to run around with the mic and just raise your hand if you have a question. She can come up to you. Sorry, I didn't mean to ignore you over there. <laughs> no worries, I'm not a millennial. Um, <laughs> so do you, sorry. Do you think trust can be uh, taught and or learned if someone, if you are working with someone who you do not believe exhibits trust, is that something that you think a person can develop? I think they can, but I think they have to think about all three of those areas, getting good at all three of those areas. Um, I think most things can be learned. Uh, I teach a leadership class as well at Stanford, and uh, a lot of people used to think, well, leaders are to the manner born. In other words, they come up with a certain d DNA, a certain whatever birthright that makes them leaders. And that may have been true a century or two ago. It is no longer true. You see leaders coming out of all kinds of walks of life. And those who become intentional and say, these are the things about leaders that make them powerful as leaders people who understood you can actually develop that. I think it's the same thing with trust. So I actually think that if, people, if somebody were to take seriously these 10 laws of trust and say, I'm going to operate within these guardrails. These are the guardrails that really are going to set my behavior organization. They will get better. They'll become more trustworthy. They'll become more able to communicate effectively, to empower others. And all of these things t tend to self-reinforce. And so yes, long, long way of saying yes, I absolutely think people can learn to, to be more trustworthy. Hi, I'm Hi. Stephen. I, I am a millennial, so <laughs> it's getting a little different. Um, you, I, I'm very interested in the fact that you serve on JetBlue's board, and I, I'm super interested in aviation. One of the events, talking about communicating during events, was when the flight attendant went off the slide at JFK and it was kind of crazy, me. right? <laughs> yeah, well, no, I'm sure it. as a board member, you probably had to deal with the, some of that. But what was interesting is it kind of broke, and probably why the story was so interesting was it broke people's trust. It broke JetBlue's trust in that person, and they're fulfilling their, their duties, and someone is a, a passenger saying, I trusted that person to be there for me and not to be jumping off the plane. How did you communicate through that, and how did you figure out, is this just one person organization that's operating on the outside, or is there a broader issue within the company that you had to address? It's a great question. That's one of the things you ask when something happens. We've had several of those incidents over the years. And so you always ask that question. What we did in that particular instance was we asked all the employees to say, what do, we, what do you think we should do? How should we handle this? Because it was their peers. It's their company. They own it too. And they want to have, you know, they want to live the values. And they were basically the ones that said, we, this person needs to be moved out. You know, I think if management had just come in and say, okay, can this, right? you would have had a lot of people kind of coming to their rescue and, and whatever, whereas because they were empowered, they all sort of came together and said, you know, this is the right thing to do. I think one of the toughest issues for any company, if you're going to build a high trust organization, a whole lot of what you have to do is get the right people on the bus and get the wrong people off the bus. And so I would say with 19,000 employees, we've got some of the wrong people on the bus. And that takes courage to go in and get them off the bus. Now you can do it generously, graciously, or whatever, but you have, it's a constant management challenge. Um, so, but we, so I will say one other thing that might, you might find interesting, and maybe you've done that here too, but we have five uh, values. Values are just priorities. And uh, can you, 
can you guess what the most important value is at JetBlue? Safety. Safety, exactly. We fly 35 million people around every year, and uh, nothing is more important than their safety. That's the number one value, and which means if it's your value, if it's really your value, you have to spend time on it, you have to spend money on it. People who give lip service to value, values, and then don't spend time or money or mental energy on it, they're, they're fooling you, you can't trust them. So if you're gonna say these are our values, you have to live true to those values. The second one is caring, you know? And I don't know if any of you saw the, there was a YouTube video that went viral. There were stories about what went on in Orlando at that shoot. I mean, we were getting ready for a JetBlue offsite in Washington, D.C. And so our CEO was up to his eyeballs in issues. As soon as that happened, he got on an airplane and flew to Orlando, even though everybody was flying in. Nobody knows that. The press didn't pick up on that. The press picked up on, on flight attendants who were empowered to do the right thing, but it got started because the CEO really cares. So we had 40 people at JetBlue who were impacted at some level or another mm -hmm. in that thing. And having the, the CEO fly down there and be with those people said that value of caring matters. And so you go down all the values and you really check yourself against, if these are our values, do we spend time, money, and mental energy on those values. If not, they're not really our values. You know, all of us would like to say, ooh, these are the ones, I'd love for these words to be associated with me. But I will tell you, if you're not spending your time, money, or mental energy on, they're not really your values. Your values may be watching soap operas or sports on TV, <laughs> you know? I have some values that I'm not proud of, but I have to say, if this is what I'm spending my time on, they really are my values. So I think uh, you're gonna have some of that, but I think you always have to true up to your values. If you're gonna build a high trust organization, you hold yourself accountable to those values. Is that at all responsive or, yeah. yeah. Thanks. For the, um, for the relations that have actually gone really sour, for example, at workplace or in, uh, in personal space, um, sometimes it, I've seen most um, people or uh, organization or uh, they kind of cut ties and say, like, hey, this has already gone sour. Why invest too much time in building trust here? It's already gone. Um, do you have like something different for in some situations? But generally, I've seen like, all right, there's no trust. So like, um, let's get rid of uh, these employees, lay off uh, in case of families or a divorce or like kid, uh, siblings don't talk to each other. Um, parents don't talk to their kids um, for a long time. If the kid has married out someone else they didn't like or something like that, right? So in those situations, I've seen mostly that they s just cut one dimension and then live their life. And I've seen people just die, you know, like uh, they just lived that life and then died, right? So what happened? Like, were, would they be better off like working on the trust there before dying? Like, we are all going to die anyways, but. Should we be working on that, like, cut links? And, and is there something different we need to do than the generally what we, you suggest? So I don't think you want to die bitter. Um, <laughs> I don't think you probably want to die. But don't die bitter, for one thing. I think there are a number of betrayals that are really very difficult to repair. And I think you're better off, in those cases, moving on to something where you can build high trust relationships. It takes too much energy. So that's one of the reasons I say, catch it early. If you find that something is happening, get it early because it will just arise later in an uglier form. So catch it and nip it in the bud. Now, if it, if I, I would say that if the stakes are really high, like a family member, if it's a spouse, if they're children or whatever, you may say it is really worth paying a big price. Usually for to repair trust though, it takes both parties. And I find it's very difficult to do if the party who's offended the other doesn't say, I am sorry, and ask for forgiveness and really mean it. And the forgiveness is only when the offended party forgives. It's not when you say, hey, I asked for forgiveness. A lot of people think, well, you know, I'm sorry if you felt that way. That's just a blame. That's not, that's not an apology. So I think you ha it, it really requires a sincere apology. And then there ha the stakes have to be high enough. And then I think you have to let go of the blame. I remember one time having a really tough time. David knows this because we had it in an early version of the book and decided to take it out. Because I was really struggling with the betrayal. I mean, it was really eating me up for too long. 
And I had a friend who gave me uh, The Count of Monte Cristo. Have any of you ever read that? It is a delicious uh, version of getting even. I mean, it's just unbelievable. But in the end, um, Edmond Dantes, who is the offended party, decides he's better off moving on. He's actually becoming the person that he hated. So it will canker your soul. It will eat you up. So it's in your interest to let go of it. So if it's high stakes, I would say get in and work out, catch it early, get in and work it out if you can. If you can't, move on to something else, you know, where you can't actually build trust. Life's too short to live in these uh, situations of high betrayal. What if both think that the other person is offended? They always do. <laughs> they always do. Nobody ever did something bad without having a justification. So they, oh, it starts out with people thinking that they were right. And so I think you have to start out understanding. And so the times that I've worked with three have not been these most serious ones, but ones that are a degree below that. I ask people to tell me what, what went on, what were you thinking, how did, it, how did this develop? And usually they have a narrative. Sometimes it's baloney, but sometimes there's really something to it. I, I think one of the more powerful things that's happened to me is when I've said, what did I do to contribute to this problem? That's a really good mindset. It's a hard mindset to have, but I, you, you almost saw this if you're really honest. What did I do to contribute to this? Odds are pretty good that you contributed something. So, you, you had a question. Mm -hmm. By the way, while the mic's coming to him, let me say I was speaking. Do any, do any of you know what Bonobos is? Yeah. But good, great. I was the original investor in Bonobos. I was the first investor. And I'm on the board at Bonobos. And uh, they had me speak to a company thing. And I said, you know, anytime I go into a situation, I think about what would winning look like? And just try to imagine what winning would look like. And, and, the, and the group was really quiet and everything. And I said, you know, to me, winning is having all of you asking lots of questions. And so I feel like I'm losing right now. And so <laughs> the hands were up all over. So I'm feeling like I'm not winning big here yet. So I'm encouraging. Maybe you've already answered some of the questions. Maybe so. Yeah, yeah maybe. maybe so. <laughs> um, so I love the notion that if you put trust in somebody, most of the time it's reciprocated, and I've kind of experienced that in my own life. Mm -hmm. But I was wondering, is it actually possible to protect yourself from sort of trusting in somebody that you could not have trusted? Uh, like either you can play conservative by only waiting until somebody trusts you to trust them back, or do you feel like trusting in everybody is worth it? Because uh, one of the couple of times that you might have your trust broken is is a very small loss compared to all the relationships that you've built. Yeah, yeah. So my view is it's good to be the leader and tr to trust somebody. You don't need to wait for them to trust you. Trust people, and but do it in increments. Do it in small amounts. I tell a story in the book about my dad uh, trusting me to learn how to drive up and down our driveway. And we had this 100 foot long driveway, and it had an L shaped drive. And you back the car out of the garage, hit the curb, and then drive up and down the driveway. And so I backed the car out of the garage, hit the curb, and then accelerated. And I forgot to put it into drive. And I went up over the curb and down into this berm and hung the car up. And I tried for a while to get it out. I realized I couldn't. So I went in to get my dad. He got the neighbors out. They pushed the car back up there. And I thought, well, that's it for driving. I probably won't drive ever again, <laughs> but certainly not in a car. And as he was walking back into the house, he turned to me and said, toss me the keys. He said, son, don't forget to take, put it in drive next time. That image has really been a powerful one to me. Trust people a little bit. If they screw up a little bit, and it wasn't for lack of effort. It wasn't for reasons of character. It was just they screwed up. Uh, toss them the keys again. And talk about it. Say what you need to do, and then try it again. So I think, I think you'd initiate trust, but you do it in small enough increments that it doesn't kill you if they betray it. Because I think, I think if, you be, if you trust 100 times, one or two times, people are going to betray it. So you just have to know that with trust comes the risk of betrayal. And so is there a way for you to measure trust? Like if you, is there some type of formula, or is it just judgment that you use to understand how trustworthy a person is or how much of that trust you want to instill in that relationship. Yeah, so I, I do a lot of um, hiring of people and I do deep reference checks and I do second and third order reference checks uh, because I think you can learn a lot from that. I also, 
go deep into somebody's background, all the way back to maybe grade school, and I try to understand what were the inflection points. When they decided to go left rather than right, what was it? And I, find, I have found a couple of things. One is that when people tend to move away from things, they tend to be less trustworthy than people who are moving toward things. Mm -hmm. So people who are always seeing the next interesting opportunity tend to be more trustworthy. I've also found that people who tend to be winners and who tend to uh, win on teams, there's something about teams. You know, when you, uh, that's not to say I don't hire people who don't work on team, but there's something about working on a team where you have to rely on each other. You know, I find a lot of times with the straight A students, which are probably everybody in this, in this room here, I, yeah, good, we got one like me. That one. Um, <laughs> but they did all the work. You know, you'd be given a group project, and they would do the whole group project because they couldn't trust anybody else to do it as well as they did. Well, people who've learned to live on teams, you know, if you play on a football team, you're not able to drop back, block the people who are trying to tackle you, throw oh, the pass, run down the field and catch the pass. So you have to have teammates. So I tend to find that that's one thing, and then I do it a little bit at a time. And, uh, and then I, I, I just make darn sure that I'm trustworthy. So if somebody tells me something is confidential, I will never breach that trust. You know, you, just, you, have, to have, you have to have really strict rules on things like that. There's no such thing as, um, you know, let me just tell I shouldn't be telling you this, but, you know, that's a trust breaker. Um, so when you look at red flags when you're when you're going through that So one of the things you said in the fluctuation of like and the way they direct the conversation of going Away from something instead of moving forward. Um, are there other red flags that you could kind of give us as best practices to see as like a, a sign of distrust or a sign of a warning or caution sign? Yeah, I think uh, another one that I always pick up on is how transparent and open and vulnerable people are, high trust people tend to be open, they tend to be transparent, they tend to say, ooh, I hadn't thought of that. Mm -hmm. Low trust people tend to have an answer for everything, they tend to hold their cards close to the vest, they tend to spin you on stuff, okay. they're know-it-alls, whatever, so there's a lot of tells, there's a lot of ways to pick up on somebody that, you know, you really wouldn't want to be in the foxhole with them. So yeah. I think our instinct, I think our heart tells us a lot of things that our mind doesn't tell us. I have a question. And as Joel mentioned, I am not a millennial, which means I've worked for many different managers and bosses, some who were Machiavellian, some who were micromanaging. And I am just wondering, how do you deal with a, an untrusting manager or boss? So there are two things you can do. One is you can get feedback to them. You may be able to do it directly, or you may have to sort of initiate a 360 review. I did that with a number of folks where I just said it would be good to do this to get the message through to them. Uh, and the other thing you can do is change jobs. <laughs> it's very difficult to get people to change their value. You know, if you have a values conflict with people, so I, I have this hierarchy of alignment that I look at where fundamentally the, the alignment starts with values, which is the, the most profoundly felt thing that doesn't change very often. It moves then to your objectives mm -hmm. in life. From your objectives, you have a strategy to get something done. From strategy, you have tactics. Who's going to do what, by when, and then from there, you get have what you measure in your controls. You know, so most of the ones below objectives can easily be compromised. Right. It's the one where you get all the way up to values where my view is people don't very often change their values. So if you find you have a values conflict, there's no, you're not trapped. You know, uh, most millennials, to get back to the millennials, most millennials believe today that they'll have 11 jobs during their work life. And I think that's wise. I mean, I, I'm, I'm actually going to write an article in praise of millennials because I think they figured a lot of stuff out that my generation didn't. So they figured out, well, if there's a conflict over values, I move on, I do something else. So I think you have those two options. Thank you. sounds like you've had uh, incredible experiences throughout your career. I'd love to hear a uh, you know, anecdote about a situation where you had to build trust uh, to achieve a business outcome and what you did to do it. So I think one of the times that trust matters the most is under stress, under duress. Um, so I was involved in a turnaround, you know, where fundamentally what a turnaround means 
is that you're out of money. You can't pay suppliers, you can't meet payroll, you can't do, I mean, you're basically an extremist. And so the only thing that's gonna get you through that is if you have trust. If people believe you're gonna do the best job you can, you know, the, the lenders will take back, so I was in the real estate business, lenders will take back property if they don't feel like you're honest. But otherwise, you know, if they feel like you're honest and trustworthy and doing the best job you can, why would they wanna take that on and find somebody else? So for me, it was a question of calling individually on lenders and just giving my, and it's not saying, trust me, I'll do a good job. It was saying, here's why you should trust me. Here's my plan. I think plans and specifics actually allow us to then trust. It's not just the warm, fuzzy, trust me thing. So for me in a workout, it was, it's really made all the difference. Is that responsive? Not so much. Enough. Like, uh, I don't know, just from what you were talking about, it sounded like, you know, how you um, build relationships with people and, and so on and so forth. Like, I think as personally, I felt like um, in my career, like building those relationships and going the extra mile does make a huge impact, but I don't have uh, as interesting experiences, you know, being the chairman of a board of, uh, you know, a major airline, or you know, working with the biggest global uh, real estate developer and things like that, so I figured you might have more interesting uh, situations that you could talk about. Well, let me. So I wasn't always the chairman. Does that mean we're done? Okay. Uh, so I recall a time early on in my career where I totally screwed up. I was dealing with a financier here in uh, New York, and I just botched the negotiation. And we used to talk uh, on Saturdays and do a deal, and then we'd make the deal, and he'd wire the money on Monday, papers to follow. It was a high trust relationship. And so I screwed this thing up. And I remember him calling me first thing Monday morning and saying, I don't think you really meant to set this deal up this way. And I thought, oh my gosh, he is right. I totally screwed that up. Well, what do you think my trust relationship with him? We, we had dinner just the other night together. After 40 years of doing hundreds of millions of dollars worth of deals together, and it started with him calling and saying, I don't think you really meant to do that. And I was a kid. I mean, I was just, I, I was pretty fresh out of business school, and it would be easy to crush me in that deal. He's going to be, he'll be fired, or something bad will happen to him. I don't, who really cares? I don't have a big-time New York financier. Who cares about this kid down in Texas? But what he did was, you know, he helped me through that. 20 years later, when the real estate markets were melting down, uh, he owned some property in Houston, Texas. And I said, I'll take those on. I, I absolutely selected the properties that he was in and said, I'm going to take those on and work them out for him. They weren't the most profitable for me, but I remembered 20 years ago. So I think what happens is you you leave these little chits around, and it can be a conversation with somebody where you do a kindness that builds trust. And you remember, I mean, my guess is that if I quiz the people in this room, you would remember the three or four teachers in your life, the three or four people in your life that believed in you and went the extra mile, as you say, for you. So I think, yeah, it may not be big or exciting or whatever, but it's a little conversation, it's a little event, doing the right thing, most of the time it pays up. Sometimes it doesn't. If you expect it to, then I think you're going to be disappointed. But a lot of times it does pay off. That's the right thing to do. And you'll be happier. And you can pass what I call the mirror test. You know, you want to pass the mirror test every day. Is that, was that any better? Much better. Thank you. <laughs> uh, it seems like as uh, consumers or citizens, we trust institutions differently than we trust the people who comprise those institutions. You know, we. We trust Congress differently than we, than we trust Congress people, that we trust newspapers differently than we trust journalists. How do you account for this difference, and what can we do to do about it to be do about it to be sort of better at making this distinction? That's it. I you know I hadn't thought of that. That's a really interesting thing. I uh, I think you're right. Um, it could be that we trust the concept. It's like Plato's uh, types. You know, where it's kind of the archetype, the perfect. Thing we, where we trust the, the type, but when we see the reality of it, we see the tragic nature of human nature. Um, 
So how do you translate that? I, I'll have to give some more thought to that. I think it's a, an interesting observation. Yeah, it's the next book. David, you work on that one. <laughs> <laughs> he's smiling. You can't see his face, but he's really excited yeah. about it. Yeah. All right, sorry. Um, I guess I might have sort of a follow-up question to when you're talking about um, apologies and forgiveness. Um, with the anecdote that you just said about you know doing something later on or trying to uh, rebuild trust in different ways, do you think then that it's absolutely necessary to receive an apology to give forgiveness, or is that something that can be freely given? You know that you put the impetus on you to just be forgiving and then hope that something comes down the road instead of trying or you know, deciding that this is a time that's gonna sever this connection or just trying to let it go, yeah. essentially, because um, trying to, I guess, be the person to do it and then not think about the winning or loss of that round, but just in a larger sense of, you know, you don't wanna live harboring this hatred, even if it's something that's, that they may never do another good thing for you again. Yeah, I think you can let go of it and I think that's the ideal. And I actually come from a religious faith where we're commanded to do that. To you know, you must forgive. It's your job to forgive others. I've just found it's really hard to do if somebody has hasn't recognized it and won't recognize it. Whatever. It's really hard to let go of that. So I think you should. I think it is possible, and I think you should strive for that. I will just tell you that it's really hard. But that's okay. Lots of things are hard in life. Um, so we have about a few minutes left. We do have books in the back, and I want to give um, Joel some time to actually sign the books for you guys. Um, we can maybe take one last question from the field and then wrap up. Okay. Well, see, now you're getting all the hands up. You really, yeah. you're, really winning. Last, you're really winning. You're really. the one last one, then it's. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hi, Joel. Thank you Hi. for coming. Yeah, um, so the four of us work on Google's U.S. multicultural team. Yeah. And one of the areas we focus is um, on the LGBT community. And yeah. we've been very impressed with what JetBlue has been doing. A lot of the conversations we have with other brands are not as on board as JetBlue is. So what recommendations would you or what suggestions would you give to other chairmen or CEOs or um, you know people in your position at different companies to kind of participate more in the LGBT community initiatives, how to establish themselves more in that that field or anything around um, the LGBT community. Yeah, so my, my view is that, um, that that it's no longer so much the, the issue of diversity, that diversity is kind of last century's term about this. I think it's about inclusiveness now. And I think inclusiveness is sort of, you're just not very smart. I think as a leader if you're not inclusive and so if you think about all of the talents that are available um, you know you you don't want to cut any talent off so I find that it it crosses uh, racial lines ethnic lines gender lines sexual orientation line it crosses all kinds of lines. you really as a business leader you're actually being stupid if you don't embrace um, all of these various uh, approaches and values yeah. Yeah. Well, I think it's a question of, in, of enlightenment. You know, I, I think people, the more enlightened they are, the more experience they've had, you know, the more things they've run, the more people they've met. You know, that's another one of these cases where I think if people just think in the abstract, they can classify people. You know, nobody likes to be classified. People are individuals. And I've rarely found that when I get to know an individual, I don't like them. And that's very rare. Uh, so I think, I think it probably starts out there. Um, so, thank you for that. Um, so, I guess to, to leave us with a, a few words, um, as uh, as we all you know read this book and share and collaborate and discuss this book, even after today, what do you want readers to kind of leave with after reading this book? What do you want them to remember? And um, and what's next for you? You can be intentional about building a high trust set of relationships in your life. There are things you can do. You can take control of it in your life. And uh, I was um, challenged by a military guy who came to me and says, you don't build trust, you earn trust. And I said, well, you do earn it, sort of on a one-off mm -hmm. conversation at a time basis, but fundamentally, you can build trust within an enterprise, within a family. So you actually think about it. So I'd, I'd really like people to say, I can take control of this powerful element in my life by learning how to manage it. Uh, and what's next for me is, um, 
I've threatened to do another. I think I have one more book in me, and I've threatened to do that. I'm gonna. I've taught at Stanford now for a quarter of a century, and I think I'm gonna die with my boots on there. I, I love teaching young people. I love the potential that I see in young people. Well, we enjoy having you today, and we're Great happy to continue to learn from you. Um, you're welcome here anytime. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.